Uh, today is a story about Anton Volzan. He is a man who hardened his character in serious battles and his worldview in communication with historical and prominent personalities. Throughout his life he didn't stay away from acute social problems, but tried to be in the flow of events. Anton Volzan was born on June 10, 1900, in the village of Vovnigi, the Katerinoslav Governorate, Ukraine. When he was nine, his father died of drowning in the Dnipro River as a result of an accident. So, after graduating from elementary school, Anton left science to help his mother and brother around the farm. In 1917, the October Revolution took place in St. Petersburg, followed by the Civil War in Russia, which led to the national liberation struggle of the Ukrainian people. There were several parties in these competitions, but the Bolsheviks stood out among all with their unjustified cruelty and hypocrisy. Under false appeals, they unceremoniously pumped Ukrainian people for bread and transported it by freight wagons to Russia. So, in 1919, Anton voluntarily joined the army of Nestor Makhno at the suggestion of Commander Stupak. Mechnovists then captured a large area on the right bank of the Dnipro River, Petihatki, Krivy Rig, Katerinoslav, Alexandrovsk, Zaporizhia. The Ukrainian insurgent army was in the city. But as there was no food in Yekaterinoslav, not to mention heavy rains and typhus broken out. For the discipline in the army dropped uh, dramatically. Uh, on December 21-24, uh, the White Russians captured Katerinoslav, and on December 13, 1919, the city was occupied by the Red Army with the assistance of Makhno. Around this time, Anton returned to Vovnigi for a short time, and soon after he was mobilized to the Red Army and taken to Poltava. In the first half of 1920, the Poltava region was headed by the re-management of the Southwestern Front, which on September 6 was reorganized into the internal service troops of the USSR. Alexander Nesvitsky tells us what the Bolsheviks did in Poltava during 1920s. In his diary, Poltava in the days of the revolution and during the turmoil of 1917-1922. The Bolsheviks were engaged in total looting. They took horses with carts, bread, cloth, linen, shoes, curtains, drapes, carpets, utensils, grand pianos, harmoniums, violins, cellos, flutes, etc. Musical notes were taken away too. Then it was the turn of the scales, Beranger for pharmacies, writing paper, indoor glaciers and refrigerators, ficus and palm trees, hair clippers. All this between the shootings and the terror of the civilian population. Naturally, a person with a healthy psyche is not very happy to be among the tourists. And in the summer, rumors about Wrangler's successful attacks began to spread constantly. In August 1920, the Baron published a call to the sons of Ukraine, in which he emphasized the existence of a common enemy, communism, and stressed that he wasn't going to revive the old Tsarist order. The main task of the White Russian army was to withdraw from the Crimea and break through the northern tower, where it was planned to replenish food supplies and join the troops of the UPR, Ukrainian People's Army, headed by Simon Petlura, with whom Wrangel was negotiating. But in early November, Wrangel's army was clogged in the Crimea. Apparently, Anton had fled home from Poltava, and there he joined the Ataman Chornachmara, Black Cloud, who had previously operated in the Zaporizhia region. That is, from the Crimea to Bucharest, Anton Volzhan and Ivan Khmara paved the way simultaneously 
in the company of Black Cloud were Anton the countryman, guys from Vovnigi and Mikilski, who had earlier been part of the Vovnisky insurgent division. Thus, Anton Volzhan on November 13, 16, 1920, together with the White Army under the flag of France and under the cover of British and French warships, sailed from Feodosia to Constantinople, occupied by the Entente. The ships were crossing the Bosphorus from November 17 to 21, then headed for the Constantinople raid, where they stayed for at least a week. There was a shortage of food, and due to the high concentration, crowding and dirt, the refugees had lice. On the shore, first of all, the soldiers were disarmed and given rations. The main reference bureau of Constantinople recorded the newcomer, Volzhanin Anton Pelipovich, born in 1900, in the armed forces of southern Russia private. Uh, the remnants of the White Army were reorganized into three corps. In particular, Kuben, 16,000 people, was taken to the island of Lemnos, which was a dry, rocky land. Cossacks lived starving in tents of 8-10 people. Looking for firewood for heating and cooking has become an acute problem. Baron Brangel then reported on his stay on Lemnos. Living conditions on the island last winter were very difficult. Unfurnished camp, stone winds that tore down tents, rains that washed away a thin layer of clay, complete isolation from the world. About a week later, Anton, along with those who didn't wish to linger on the inhospitable island, was already standing on the Aegean coast. The refugees were taken by boat to a steamer that sailed to Constantinople. There, men were recruited to the French Legion, Morocco, and even Indochina. Ukrainians hadn't been agreed until recruiters uh, to Romania and uh, Bulgaria appeared. Anton was among those who volunteered for Romania because it was close to home. In mid-December 1921, the ship sailed for Romania. There was enough food on the steamer, everything would have been fine if December 1920 hadn't been the month of the worst storms in the Black Sea. But in three days, the ship finally arrived in the port of Constanza. From there, the settlers were transported to the Tehirgiol camp, which was located in a resort area 16 kilometers from Constanza. The internees were placed in villas, hotels and boarding houses, uh, where they were given a wash and a haircut, disinfected and provided with medical care. The camp was surrounded by barbed wire, it was guarded by the army, but there was nowhere to run and no need to. Those who wished were allowed to walk around the neighborhood. The campers gathered, sang songs, listened to lectures. In March 1921, they were even visited by the future Romanian King Carol II, who was returning from Greece with his wife Helena. As the warm weather approached, Hergiola's hotels and villas had to be vacated, and in early April 1921 the emigrants were transported to Bucharest. They went to the Danube by train, then across the temporary bridge on foot and again to Bucharest by train. In the Rom Romanian capital, refugees came under the care of the Romanian military. Ukrainians kept their fighting spirit high, made their own boots, sewed uniforms and didn't give up hope of returning home. The were well fed, could go to the city where many of them saw the real capital for the first time in their lives. One day the barracks were visited by General Sergei Delvig, military attaché head of the Ukrainian military mission at the UPR embassy in Romania, who was interested in the living and working conditions of his compatriots. 
As Valjean was transferred to civil status and his documents were issued, he went to work in a wood warehouse. The men cut firewood with a round chainsaw. One put the wood on the saw, the second cut it, and the third to cut products and throw them aside. Working outdoors, great weather, borscht with meat for lunch, plenty of bread, pasta on Sundays, and celery on Saturdays. When the season ended, Anton was hired to build a huge artificial ice factory, Frigul, where everyone could earn money. A large barrack with a kitchen was built in the yard for the workers. They ate four of them from a tank, a tin vessel with partition walls. While Ukrainians were plotting how to live on, Nestor Vakhno himself suddenly arrived in Romania on August 28, 1921, as reported in the first days of September by Romanian newspapers under the headline General Makhno arrived in Romania. Of course, many went to build to the hotel to talk to Batko, as Mahno was called. Ivan Khmara also met with him and expressed such a sincere interest in anarchism that Mahno appointed him chief of staff. At the time, Mahno was trying to establish relations with Pitlura, and Khmara might come in handy as a man who had once been in close contact with Dr. Giliev, who had special powers from Simon Pitlura, and was appointed organizer of the insurgent movement in the Yekaterinoslav region. Having arrived in Romania, Makhno began to gather allies. At the time, Ukrainians still had no doubt that one day they would take up arms again to liberate the motherland from the Czechist Bolshevik invasion. There were rumors that some insurgents were still fighting in Ukraine, and they needed help. And in the autumn of 1921, Yurko Tutunik prepared a plan for the second winter campaign on the territory of Ukraine in order to raise an anti-Bolshevik uprising. Romania didn't look like a suitable place to achieve the goal. Much more Ukrainians lived in Poland. There was an army of the Ukraine, Ukrainian People's Republic, which had previously fought side by side with the Poles to gain independence from both nations. It all ended when Poland gained independence, and the um, UPR army found itself in Polish camps behind barbed wire. But from Romania, uh, the Poles seemed to be a friendly nation which should provide a field of activity and better conditions for the preparation of the campaign and crossing the Polish-Soviet border. Three years later, when the defendants were given their final say in the Polish court, Machno would say, when I crossed the border, I was counting on the hospitality of the Slavic people, followed by Khmara, I have nothing to say. So, in early 1922, Khmara invited Valjean to join the anarchists, and he agreed. On April 2, a group of emigrants led by Makhno headed from the border with Poland in the direction of Galicia. Most are old Makhnovists, that is, those soldiers who had come to Romania with Makhno. Anton will say later, I wasn't introduced to any secrets there, I was shunned because I am illiterate. And so it was, the old Makhnovists were indeed very of those who joined them in Romania, but not because of their ignorance, they themselves were far from intellectuals. They were just considered newcomers as unreliable. Anton described the Mechnovis transition to Poland as follows. 40 km kilometers from Bucharest, we were detained by the police and taken to prison. When we were detained by the Romanian authorities, Machno told us to say during interrogation that we intended to flee to Czechoslovakia. Three days later, the Romanian police let us all cross the border into Poland. That's how I ended up in Poland. According to Anton, at the second attempt to cross the border, there were 
10 12 people, white guards and former Mechnovists. At the same time, Anton had the impression that the Romanian police was in collusion with Mahno. The Poles detained the group in the town of Husatin, now Ternopil region. After inter inter interrogation on April 12, 1922, the group was taken to an internment camp in Stalkovo, one of the largest in the Poznan voivodeship. Halina Kuzmenko, Yakiv Domashenko, Ivan Lepetchenko, Ivan Hmara, Vasil Harlamu, Fedir Moroz, Konstantin Kravchenko, Gnat Kuhut, Maxim Shulak, Adolf Krasnovolsky, Yuhim Burima, Anton Volzan, Platon Vasilenko and others arrived there together with Machno. The captain of the UPR you remember uh, that it's uh, the Ukrainian People's Republic Army, Nikifor Avramenko, tells us about the moment when the Meknovists arrived at the camp. There is a group of people from the commandant's office, about 30 of them. One step ahead, Batko Machno and his wife. Behind them the rest, a brotherhood. In their hands are small curves. They look with interest at the community of thousands, smiling boldly, independently. Machno limps on his left leg. All have black shorts on, two or three wear jackets. Boots are on their feet, good shoes. Batko in leggings. From this group one stands out with clothes and a look of a smart person. It's the chief of staff, the Black Cloud. He is well built, has a calm ex ex expression of a man who has gone uh, through everything. He wouldn't be surprised by anything. He feels here as if he didn't get out of the regimental train. A photographer from among the soldiers of the Ukrainian People's Republic asked to take a photo in memory and he was allowed. In this photo Anton is second from the right. He is less than 22 years old. In September 1922 the Polish gendarmerie arrived at the camp and Anton Volzhan, along with a dozen other Meknovists, was arrested and taken to the Warsaw defense where he would spend almost a year. Machno, Mara, Doroshenko and Kuzmenko went to court. On December 1, 1923, they were acquitted, and after that, Lepetchenko, Zaitsev, Borima, and Volzhan left Warsaw for Volkovysk, 200 kilometers from Warsaw, for logging to earn some money. The work turned out to be hard, but well paid. A month and a half later, Lepetchenko got a letter from Machno, who wrote that he lived in Torun, but would be in Warsaw in one day, and asked Lepetchenko to come there after receiving the telegram. Zaitsev expressed a desire to go to a meeting with Machno. Borima and Volzhan remained in Volkovysk, and almost a year later, in November 1924, they both found themselves in Warsaw again. At the same time, Lepetchenko was returning from Danzig and on the way back he met Sergeyenko, who told him that Burima and Volzhan were now here in Warsaw, ready to cross the border illegally and go to Gulai Pole. In mid-November 1924, Lepetchenko and his wife Borima and Volzhan boarded a train reached Shepetivka station. In the evening at 8-9 o'clock they passed freely in the area of Shepetivka and appeared on the Soviet outpost. From there they were sent to Slavuta, where the group confessed to crossing the border illegally. On the second day all were taken to Kharkiv. A week later, Anton was released, given temporary documents and went to Dnipropetrovsk for registration. Dressed in a European way, in a fashionable coat and beautiful boots, Anton finally returned to Vavnihi in December 1924. He told his family that he was working in Poland. He is only 24 years old and has a kaleidoscope of events and rich life experience behind him. He devoted himself wholeheartedly to farming. A year later he married his friend's sister Mokrina Vasilenko. 
In 1926, daughter Vera was born. In 1927, daughter Yavdoha. In 1929, daughter Hanna, due to cons the construction of dams of the Dnipro River, part of Vnigi fell under flooding. A new village Kalinin was built for displaced people, five kilometers from their native of Nigi. The Volzans moved there. In 1931, another daughter, Luba, was born, and a year later, the NKVD arrested Anton. At the time, many unreliable people were taken in prison for performa, registered, and then released. It seemed that everything was over. However, during the period of collectivization and repression, Anton Voljan behaved like a caring citizen of his country, like a pet lurist. He spoke out against the collective farms, argued for the disadvantages of collective farming, and said that it was the same as the Lord's economy. You would work for the Lord and you would be left barefoot. He organized mass exits for collective farms with the dismantling of property. He pointed out when working days were recorded incorrectly. He agitated for the collective farmers not to sign the loan for the county's defense because uh, this money would go into the pockets of the communists. Anton worked as a groom on the Kalinin collective farm. In 1936 his long-awaited son Stepan was born. Suddenly, on March 10, 1938, Czechists broke into the stable. Anton barely had time to take off his coat to leave it to his family and put an old sweatshirt on, and left the village forever. His wife wasn't allowed to see him, and care packages weren't accepted. On the same day, an employee of the Solonansky Regional Department of the NKVD conducted a search. The silver medal of 1893 and the military ticket in the name of Voljan were withdrawn. The formal charge was illegal border crossing in 1924. When asked by the investigator with whom he had been in contact in exile, Anton replied, I wasn't personally connected with anyone, I was connected with the organization created by Mahno, because I was a member. On June 17, 1938, the last interrogation which was conducted by the head of the Petropavlovsk district office of the NKVD, Vasil Perepelitsa, the interrogation report is completely different from the previous ones because Ivan Daragan, deputy head of the USSR department for the Dnipropetrovsk region, took up the case. The protocol made by Parapelitsa now consists of two parts. The first one about Mahno and emigration is almost rewritten from the previous protocols, and the second one looks more like Parapelitsa's creative work. The defendants' answers were set out in dry bureaucratic language and kind of written off from the NKVD's manual on the creation of a counter-revolutionary organization. The NKVD Troika sentenced Anton Voljan to death. His personal property was to be confiscated. On November 14, 1938, the sentence was carried out. Anton Voljan was rehabilitated on May 16, 1989. Concluding Remarks Mokrina raised her children in terrible poverty, one pair of boots for the whole family. She didn't tell a lot about their father to her kids, and they didn't ask much. Daughter Hanna lived to ripe old age, but she couldn't tell anything about her father, because she knew nearly nothing. This was the goal of the communists, to erase the memory of the rebel fathers and to bring up their children in the communist spirit.